All right, uh, today we're gonna be uh, looking at whether or not language changes the way your mind works. And in particularly, we're gonna be looking at perception. So does language, does the language that you've learned, does that change perception? And can you maybe alter perception by changing the language that you use? This is really kind of complicated, very controversial area of psychology. Uh, so I'm gonna try to, to be uh, as conservative and as skeptical as I can uh, moving forward. So today we're gonna be looking at this question of the wharf hypothesis. So uh, number one, um, do we all see the same colors? That's gonna be where we're gonna start off. We're gonna uh, launch from that into what the wharf hypothesis is, what are the different variations? There's a strong wharf hypothesis and a weak wharf hypothesis. And then we're gonna wrap it up by looking at the current evidence for both of these ideas to see what kind of uh, what kind of validity or what kind of truth we can find in these theories. Okay, so starting off, do we all see the same colors? This is a really complicated question because the answer uh, is unfortunately yes and no. Um, so stick with me. Uh, yes, we do all see the same colors. This is because we have the same kind of combs, the same kind of rods, the same kind of eye shape, the same lateral geniculate nucleus, the same kind of visual cortex uh, that everyone else on the world has, regardless of you know your race, regardless of your ethnicity, regardless of your religion, or regardless of uh, you know your your background or the language that you've learned. We all have the same kind of eye, so we all kind of detect light the same way that you know, your neighbor does, or someone completely across uh, the other end of the world. So, yes, we do all see the same kinds of light, but, and this is where it gets kind of tricky, is really impossible for us um, to, and this kind of boils down to semantics almost, uh, it's really impossible for us to verify whether or not the same colors that I see are the same colors that you see. So, for example, take this color right here, this blue. How do you know that this blue that you see is the same blue that I see? Uh, yeah, we might be able to agree that this color is blue, but how do you know that what I am seeing and what I'm perceiving in my mind's eye isn't actually what you would consider orange? Uh, or vice versa, maybe, um, you know, you see this as orange and I see it as blue, um, but we both call it blue because that's just what we've learned. Um, there's really not a good way to, to test against that. It's more of a philosophical argument. And because it is subjective like that, there's not really a good way uh, for us to, to test it. It's kind of a thought experiment more than anything else. But it leads us into this idea that maybe there are certain things that, uh, that we perceive differently. And that's what a lot of sensation and perception is about, right? It's about how we individually perceive the world differently from one another, even though the way that we detect the world is largely the same. Our eyes are all pretty much the same, unless you know you need glasses or you know maybe you're colorblind and, and do some colors or something like that. But for the most part, we all see roughly the same. Okay, so this is where I'm going to take a little bit of a pause to talk about why this kind of, uh, why this research is controversial. It's controversial because uh, the, the kind of, the people who are f uh, against it will say that it is kind of like a, um, uh, scientific colonialism, that this research is all about proving that one language is better than another language. Uh, and that's absolutely, um, that, I mean, that's not my read of it, uh, and that's certainly not what I'm trying to talk about here. Um, obviously, there's not a, a one language is better than others. They're all good at different things, right? Um, <clears throat> So just keep that in mind as we move forward. I'm not trying to I'm not trying to speak on any you know any language is better than any other language. Um, okay, so what is the Wharf hypothesis? The Wharf hypothesis is the idea that language can influence your perception and in particular your visual perception. Uh, and there's some research to back this up. The earliest kind of examples of this were looking at Native American languages and what they found. Are, so, for example, uh, one of the things that they found is that like uh, certain tribes, so like Native American tribes, uh, would uh, not have a word for a certain color. And because they didn't have a word for that color, they seemed to not really be able to perceive that color. So, for example, if you had never learned the word brown, then you would not perceive the word, or you, sorry, you would not perceive the color brown. That's really wild to think about, right? Big if true, right? That would be, you know, incredible if that's true. And it's not necessarily true. Uh, the truth is a little bit more, um, a little bit more nuanced than that. And so the strong wharf hypothesis uh, asserts that basically you can change your entire perception simply based on you know the words and the languages that you've learned. 
that the colors that you see, shapes and weights and distances are all different fundamentally based on uh, the, the language that you've learned. Now, the evidence against that um, is that simply that we know that there are people who don't have access to language. Um, so, for example, uh, if some you know if someone grew up not learning a language, which you know uh, there are cases of I mean, people who are isolated, people who are abandoned, um, uh, that they can grow up w without language, but still be able to you know perceive the world, even though they don't have language. So there's a lot of evidence against the strong morph hypothesis. It's largely been debunked in a lot of different ways. Um, but there's also the weak wharf hypothesis, which is kind of like the wharf, it looks like diet wharf or something like that. Uh, and what the, uh, the weak wharf hypothesis kind of asserts is that, uh, okay, language doesn't completely shape your perception, but it may influence it to some degree. And uh, the, the kind of one of the, the, uh, the, the good pieces of evidence for this uh, involves a basic memory task. And so, for example, you see this, this color hue right here. Think about that color hue. I'm going to take it away, and then I'm going to show you uh, two other colors right here. Okay, so which of these two colors did you see initially? Um, now, this should be a pretty easy judgment for you to make. And the reason why it's an easy judgment for you to make, especially if you are a native English speaker, is that we have very good words to describe the differences between these two colors. We have good color boundaries uh, or color categories to distinguish blue versus green. And so we perceive there to be a pretty good difference between these two things. And so our memory for that first hue, we know which one it was, right? Um, but Let's try a, a slightly more tricky example. All right, so think of, to take a look at this hue. I'm going to take it away, and I'm going to show you two other hues. Now, this one, this this distinction is a little bit harder. It should be a little bit harder for you to uh, discriminate which of these was the first one that you saw. And the reason for that is because they are both within the same kind of color name. We don't have a good color. It's not as simple as blue versus green like it was in the other time. We don't have two categories for these two kinds of blues. So, or greens, whatever word you want to use. And so memory for this can be a little bit trickier. Now, if we want to look at how, how, how different these colors are, they're not that different, you know, based purely on their hue. There's not you know, any difference here compared to the first pair that you saw. The difference though, is that we can easily categorize these two and not, uh, or sorry, we can easily categorize the first two, but not these two. Um, okay, so uh, other examples for this uh, are, more of an applied example is that, uh, that kind of gets brought up a lot is that uh, Rush, the Russian language, for example, has uh, at least two distinct colors for blue. And these are words that can easily group a light blue versus a dark blue. And they use them very easily, um, but they don't, but Russians don't have a good word uh, for pink. Um, and so if I were to show you a red and a pink, uh, and being an English speaker, you would say these are two different colors. Um, if I were to show this to, a, to someone who speaks Russian, they would say that, yeah, they're the same colors, but they're not really, they're, you know, the same kind of color, but they're not distinct. Um, they're just, you know, one's brighter than the other, one's softer than the other. Um, and so our perception, and I guess this is a take-home message, is that our perception is guided by language. It's not created by language, but it's, it's, it's slightly influenced by language based purely on how we describe and how we group together experiences. So how we group together these colors can dictate our memory for these kinds of colors. Um, it, maybe the best way to put it is, is not even my own example. This is a, a student in one of my classes uh, brought this up and, and, and I love this example. If I told you, go to Home Depot and pick out the color green, you would go out and you would uh, go to the paint aisle and you'd pick out a swatch of green. If I asked your neighbor, if I asked uh, anyone that you know, go to Home Depot and pick out a green, you would all pick out greens. Would you pick the same, the, the exact same color? No, because there's lots of different variations of it, right? But you'd all roughly be within the same ballpark. So now let's extend that to maybe someone who, uh, who whose language um, uh, has both a, a word for really dark green and a word for kind of medium softer green. 
if I asked them again to go pick out a certain shade of green, they would go and, and there would be less variability in the kind of color swatches that they would choose. Just like if we took Russians and we asked them to go pick out uh, you know, the color red, they would, we'd probably have some people who come back with pink and some people who come back with dark red and we'd laugh and we'd, you know, being English speakers, we'd say, ha ha ha, that's very funny. You know, this is actually pink, this isn't red. How silly, right? Um, but it's just because they don't have a good name boundary to segregate uh, those uh, different kind of perceptual experiences. So, even though, you know, the Warf hypothesis seems really interesting and really cool, the evidence for the strong work at Warf hypothesis isn't really there. But for weak work, war, weak war hypothesis, uh, there's some evidence to suggest that in some cases that, that does hold up. That language does influence how we perceive the world around us.